right, Engine Performance Expo viewers, we're back. Obviously, you just saw me and Ben talking about our fuel pressure problem, so we decided to bring in our main man, George Bryce, and this is something new that we've not done in the past. We have a whiteboard behind us. That way, as we discuss stuff, if we feel free to draw and write, we can, because if you've not watched them yet, Tech Talk Tuesdays on YouTube, this guy is an absolute rock star. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, Ben's a fantastic teacher, but George, you're pretty close, buddy. Ah, we're getting along good. We, we have a we good time together, good, for yeah. sure, yeah. So, so you yeah, know, Tech Talk Tuesday, a little plug for George's Thank channel. You. And But you're always on the whiteboard yep. drawing stuff out. So I figured we probably, with both of these guys and their whiteboard skills, we should probably have a whiteboard available. So as we discuss these things... We can do it. So gives you something to do with your hands anyway, right? That's right. That's right. I'm already holding my mark. <laughs> He's already ready to go. Yeah. So obviously the, the video we just watched, we had the engine. We made 1,046, 47 horsepower, but we knew that we were out of fuel pump, yep. not so, fuel. Yeah. So I think we had kind of both issues, right? We had mm -hmm. a, a pump issue. We kind of got around that. Then we had kind of a regulator issue. We worked around that. And... So the, the goal was, though, just keep working on it, keep, keep tuning on it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, when we talk about engine tuning so often, George, mm -hmm. I, think, um, I think at least nowadays there's this idea that tuning is this magical sort of, you could do it with a laptop, but the reality is forget about laptops, forget about screwdrivers and fuel pumps and all that. Tuning is really just, I got this engine over here that's doing this. And it's telling you what it wants. Yeah. If it, we or, would just listen. Yeah, we got to get it over here to do that, so we got to listen to the engine. Yeah. So, you know, when we, when we think about tuning for mm -hmm. example you're just changing things and really you're, you're saying i want to observe the result did the engine like it or not like it how am i going to know i got to listen to the engine yeah it's telling you even with it just being data output it's still telling you what it needs and i was going to ask you when you figured out that it was out of pump how did you know that first um, the first way we knew it um you could see, you know, you, your, your sort of default data, right? Is go, oh, what's my air fuel ratio, there right? Well, the problem is the air fuel ratio was okay. Oh, okay. And you go, oh, well, that's cool. We're doing a great job because we're such great tuners, right? <laughs> but as we're sitting there, I'm like, wait a minute. That's interesting because I see the air fuel ratio is okay, mm -hmm. but I also see the fuel pressure is dropping. So right. what was happening was I wasn't necessarily a great tuner. My closed loop oxygen sensor control was saying, hey, if you don't do something about this dropping fuel pressure, this thing's going to get lean and I'm going to save you from yourself. So I noticed that my, my um, air fuel ratio was okay, but yeah. I also noticed that to get it okay, it needed a ton of positive enrichment. And I thought, well, why would it, why would it need that? It right. was talking to me. That's right. It was telling you loud and clear. Sometimes we don't want to hear that because we have our own mind made up of what parts it needs and what it should use based on some prior experience or somebody telling us on the phone that yeah. you need this and you need this. And then if you do better than they did, you're going to outrun the, the ideas they had. Yeah. And that's why we always have to be pretty available for some different out-of-the-box thinking. Well, there's Always. a lesson to be learned there, too, which, which is when you start out with the idea that I'm going to tune this engine. Well, yeah. It doesn't matter. You did motorcycles. Yeah. You know, I worked on a lot of whatever. But at the end of the day, we start out with what do we want from it? Right. Well, if I stopped at I'm happy when it has a good air fuel ratio, right. I might have been in trouble. Right. right? Yeah. So I ha if I have just said, hey, look, I'm the world's greatest tuner because the air fuel ratio is good, I may not have noticed that it wasn't my tuning that got us there. It was the help from that, that, you know, that safety backup from the O2 sensor, and that was what started the whole conversation. And now, is that a Murphy funny. switch or dummy proof? <laughs> I, I, I don't know, but if it's dummy proof, I'm just dumb enough to prove it. Uh, you know, well, so. I just know that the draw dropping moment was when we actually looked at what the injector duty cycle was yeah. and how much fuel it thought it was putting into the engine. We're there like, oh, there's no way it put that much fuel in. There's a problem. Okay. And sure enough, you looked it up. Okay. This pump is rated for this much power, and boy, we're right there at we're, the limit of that. Knocking on the door. How yeah. many wide bands did you have on it? If I remember right, we had two. Mm -hmm. We had one that was for the computer and one that was for the dyno, so that we could look at both. Okay, of them. now where was the wide band located? In the in one collector? Uh, in, in both sides, in okay. both collectors. Okay. You know, so you're looking for both agreement between the sides, That's and right. you're looking for backing up that data. You know, but as Lake said, one of the clues is you're like, well. You know, if I look at my, in our case, we're doing fuel injection, right? right? But if I look at my fuel table and I mm -hmm. can work out how much fuel it's theoretically putting in the engine, right? right? So I had that number and right. that, that sort of made sense. But then I look over at my dyno that's physically measuring fuel flow and that thing was like through the roof. And I was like, well, that, that can't be. Like, how could I have this in my table, my air fuel ratio, that's this wonderful thing that we're, we hope we're going to get, right? right? 
and and for those to be true and for this to be true, somebody's lying. Right. And so I thought, well, well, shoot, man, like we're missing this somewhere. And so at the end of the day, you know, you look at here's what the dyno says, here's what the wideband says, here's what the data logger says, then it's your job as the tuner right. to start trying to figure out who's who's telling the truth and who's not telling the truth, or who believes they are. And we also have always one sonar is going to run out first. For yes. sure. Yeah. And if you're doing um, if you're doing one wideband per side, or you're measuring air fuel ratios on an average, sometimes it's hard to find that one guy. And <clears throat> what I was going to say is, is we learned the hard way after we burned some when they were lean and the others weren't. And and so we ended up with eight wide bands. Yeah. And even in the pro stock car way back when, we were running eight wide bands and we, we would have like the air fuel ratio would, we would have one of every color for every cylinder <laughs> yep. going down the racetrack. <laughs> and you know, and it would, some of them would look like that. And I'm like, yeah, but I got a, a Holly carburetor with eight jets in it. Why am I getting this? It should look like this according to the book. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's hard to get there. It's real hard to get there. Yeah. yeah. So at the end of the day, you're trying to get them all to sort of average through yeah. there, you know. Yeah. And so when you talk about a Holly carburetor with eight jets, we're talking about well, I got the injectors. ability to take each of these fuel injectors and tune one injector like it was eight one cylinder engines. That's right? right. That's right. And so we have this idea that man, I should be able to go there and just make this thing perfect. And sometimes you scratch your head and go, man, the engine just she won't take that. It, it doesn't like that. No. Nope. You know? And then if you were running a really big cubic inch high RPM V twin, <clears throat> like we did in NHRA, is the two cylinders. I treated them like two engines. Yep. The rear cylinder had to be tuned to get what it could get, and the front cylinder had to be tuned to get what it could get, and they were not the same. Uh, how much different would those those engines be? Five to ten percent fuel. Wow, that's big. Yeah, wow. and a lot. And and on the dyno, it was very little. But on the racetrack, because of the dynamics of the intake air and the speed and everything going mm -hmm. on, and also the two two cylinders robbing and sharing with sure. each other absolutely oh, yeah. through yeah. the through the plenum or the mm -hmm. hood scoop. Yep. So you see this often when you work on an engine that's got a common plenum, and you oh, think, right. well, I'm gonna I'm gonna take cylinder number seven and I'm gonna add three percent more fuel, and you go, well, that's weird because number three or four or six over there, it also got some more fuel, so it yeah. must have been talking to each other. There's we action a lot going on. Oh, yes, we did. There's a lot of uh, communication going on yes. in that yeah. manifold. Yeah, yeah and that's you know, very and, and you made a good point there. Like, you know, we could tune till our heart's content on the dyno. Right. But boy, when you put that thing in the car or the bike and you yes, go down we, the track, you know, you also you have... I want to win when I'm on the pavement. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I don't care about winning on the dyno. I just want to learn on the dyno and then take everything I learned on the dyno and then put it to the track yeah. and get the little scoreboard to light up the best and, numbers. And did you find that a struggle in your career? Would yeah. you show up at the track with a killer tune-up thinking, I got these guys, and, man, what happened? Did you ever have that? Maybe at first, because, and uh, the more instrumentation and the more measurement I was able to get, the more confused I got. But <clears throat> at the end of the day. Data overload. Yeah, that, yeah, it was um, paralysis, analysis paralysis uh -huh. as also. We can't even make the next round. I'm studying too much. <laughs> But um, yeah, it was uh, it was really great to learn, and all of a sudden, when it started coming to you, it was easy to translate. This is this. I even heard the, the first I guy say, "I got my dyno carburetors, and I got my track carburetors." Okay. <clears throat> now, in in the uh, fuel injected pro stop motorcycles, no, nah, we would just have a track map, mm -hmm. and then we would have a dyno map, and we would use that to start with, you know, to tune all sure. five. Yep. And everywhere we went, it would want a little something different, of course. Mm -hmm. Everywhere we went. But I wanted to also throw in, we kind of ran over it pretty fast a minute ago, was we're married to this number, this 13.2 or this 12.8 or whatever this air fuel ratio is that we get off the mm -hmm. lambdas or the wide bands. Right. And that's not exactly what you need. That is a nice target. The time slip and the scoreboard, <laughs> when it lights up with the number that you need to be number one qualifier, you can go back and check your data, and it might be wrong. Yeah. But that means the data was wrong, not the time slip. So it's funny you say that. I have a good memory of that one time we were racing, and it's back when I was doing uh, racing with the pro stock guys, you know, and man, I'll be honest, we were getting our butts kicked. Mm. And one of our buddies that, you know, you race against comes over and he was talking about some completely different problem, you know, but happened to be the laptop was open there and he kind of looked over and he goes, what the heck is that? And we looked at it and he goes, man, I could never get my air fuel ratios to look that flat. And I'm like, well, I guess that didn't really matter then, did it? <laughs> that wasn't the secret. No, but, you know, it's a piece of the puzzle. So right. what we do is we start out like when you when you go buy a puzzle mm -hmm. at Walmart yep. and you spread it out on the table, you got all these different things and you can start on wherever corner you want. But by the time you get done, 
it should look like what you what the goal was, right? That's like right. The, the picture of the box. So, like you know, I have a I have a school. Right? I teach people a tune, right. and so I like, I say, look, put the wide bed down, put the laptop down, put all the tools down until you establish what the goal is. That's right. We can't begin because right. I don't know when to stop. Right, you mm. can pick at this thing forever, but That's eventually, right. like you said, we got to take it and go to the track, and we got to win. Yeah. So we try to establish our goals first, and that guides our process of tuning, which again is just an iterative testing session. Right, so I'm trying to get it to this goal. The engine's saying I like this or I don't like yeah, that. Right. It's talking to me, yeah. right? And you know, I've got all this other correlative data to say the wideband says this, the fuel flow says that. You know, the fuel pressure is doing this, and you know, we're scratching our head trying to figure out why, but at the end of the day, our goal was, okay, yes, we want the air fuel ratios to look good. Yeah. But honestly, we want that to look good with the proper amount of fuel flow. We want the engine to make a ton of power. We want it to be reliable, not blow up. You know, there's a lot of people counting on us. Yep. So the goal wasn't necessarily, how do I get my air fuel ratio flat? That's right. Well, interesting happened this, this week. So in trying to get everything done for this sh show today and tomorrow, we actually dyno dad's engine on Tuesday. And we went from the Sunoco E15, the NASCAR fuel, which is unleaded, like 104 octane. And we put in the VP Q16, which mm -hmm. we had run in. We know a little about that. Right? And it's like, well, we knew that was probably make some more power. And it's leaded and it's 116 octane. We're like, okay, well, we were running 29 degrees timing. Oh, this should take more. Mm -hmm. It didn't want more. Mm -hmm. 29 degrees is what that engine wanted With that for. Fuel. For that, yeah. with that, even though there were two different octane fuels, yeah. for that bore size, for that cylinder head, everything, 29 was what it was. But that goes back to you, George, saying the engine's going to tell you what it wants. I wanted to add that. This, yeah. the carbureted, and I hate to keep bringing this up because the world is so fuel injected now, and right. I'm good with that. I love it. This is a typical air fuel ratio going down the track on a carbureted engine. Okay. It's lean at low RPMs, rich at high RPMs, lean at low RPMs, rich at high, going through the gears. Yeah. And when we put take that off and put fuel injection on and we get this tuned just like this, perfect, it doesn't go faster. Mm -hmm. So that's telling me something. <clears throat> Maybe this air fuel ratio that's perfect, it might need to be a little bit, a little bit lean down low and it might be need to be a little bit rich up high. It, it, the, the, the noise, the, the story it's telling mm -hmm. me is don't make it all about what you think it needs to be, give it what it wants. For years I've said that the mistake that we have made through all this sophistication and technology is that we've kind of turned tuning yep. into a video game. Right oh, now, now it's yeah. about getting that number yep. mm -hmm. rather than, you know, let, let me pick on you, say in the old days, That's right? Right. in the I'm old days, that. you actually had to talk to the engine. You had to look at spark plugs. You had yep. to look at the tailpipe. You yep. had to, you know what I mean? And what you said, the, what did the time slip tell me? That's right? the boss. So you didn't care yeah. what the air fuel ratio was if it was faster, yep. you know? And so, so often we have today with all of our sophistication turned tuning into this video game of yeah. like you know i go to the track and i see some guy with his laptop up there and he's pounding away i say hey, what you know what are you doing he goes well you know on the dyno it was 13 air fuel ratio but now it's 12.9643 you know, seven decimal places right. out there yeah. i'm going man yeah. that is not where it's at no you know? so at the end of the day we have to use all of the tools we have not just the really slick sophisticated sure squiggly lines yeah. you the, know? So. the boss is the performance results not what we're trying to make it be and that's a really great cutting i mean a really great starting point it's like the bar we set mm -hmm. and then if you're going to be married to that setting you're going to go this fast mm -hmm. but if you want to outrun everybody that's married to that bar and i hate to keep using that word but we are stuck with it well it could be like for example with the q16 right, right? look up the data sheet that the stoichiometric air fuel ratio for that fuel is 13.3 that's right so okay that gives you a place to, to be start. right yeah. to start you know you know that if i'm you know leaner than that or i'm richer than that where i need to be so i want to start on the safe side so you can get an idea where to start right but then you have to listen to what the engine is telling you like we did on tuesday and say okay it wants this give it that jet give it that timing then let it run you, you start know? out saying i really want this thing to have 30 degrees and the yep. engine's like i don't really care what you want <laughs> this, is, this is what i'm doing so yeah, yeah. At, at the end of the day i think the real lesson of tuning either on the chalkboard or on the racetrack is that you've got to listen to what yep. the machine is trying to it tell has you. a megaphone yeah. on it yelling at you <laughs> it does it, <laughs> it has a personality of its own yep. and when you change fuel you change spark plugs you change all these different variables it'll start to 
talk back to you. It'll yeah. be interesting to watch out the next couple of days of how this process worked as we were tuning on that engine, trying to get it to go. Right. Yeah. Well, especially to stay tuned for tomorrow because we get toward the end of the day tomorrow, it's going to be really good Should because be right. we had to go into some uncharted territories. We won't yeah. we won't give away all the stuff yet, but okay. you know it, it was pretty pretty good you know yeah well george thanks for hanging out thank a few you. minutes thank and talking you, with us about tuning yep. so, so great to stand up here with you yeah, yeah it is we'll so all somewhere. right so we're gonna now go to the next video which is again me and ben but because we weren't <laughs> so sure about whether or not we heard it yeah. when we ran it maybe a little bit lean yeah. we decided to do a leak down test so hang out watch the video as we do a leak down test on the epe ls engine What a day, what a day, what a day. Uh, yeah, my brain, my brain is swollen. I've learned so much today. They told us, don't start cars. We are not